if you're of the opinion that some of the granite objects from ancient Egypt, the biggest and the best, the obelisks, the sarcophaguses, the statues, were made by an ancient civilization, a lost civilization, somewhere deep in prehistory, I still have questions for you. Because for me, it doesn't make much sense. It doesn't make much sense, guys. I'm just being honest with you. All of those claims, they always revolve around lines on the rocks, which could be an important piece of the puzzle, maybe, but that's just one piece of evidence, isn't it? That's not the full picture. It ignores the context that they're found in, the style of these objects, what these objects represent. And if these objects were made by a lost civilization, then it would raise a lot of questions about the style and the context of these objects. So, don't take this the wrong way. These are my sincerely asked questions. Ooh, that's bright. It's nothing personal. This is just what I think about when I hear such a bold claim. And just so we're clear, I don't believe that the lines on the rocks are significant evidence because time and time again, it's been shown that the technology available to the Egyptians could work granite. And as long as it was possible for them to do it, then the only leap of imagination I need to take is that the Egyptians were great craftspeople, great artists, great masons. That's already so obvious from everything else they left behind. So for me, the lines on the rocks are just not convincing. And they would raise all these questions about the context of these objects. So that's it. These are my sincerely asked questions. I don't think I'm better than anyone, smarter than anyone else. I'm not an expert in nothing. If you want to take these questions and throw them in the bin, Volkswagen, uh, do that, do that. This is nothing personal. These are just ideas that I'm questioning. Question number one, if you concede that the Egyptians could wear granite, then it seems like we're just arguing about how much effort they're willing to put in. Like if you say they couldn't make the obelisks or the sarcophaguses or the statues, but they could make little granite things, seems kind of disrespectful to their abilities to just arbitrarily decide that the good monuments from this culture were made by someone else but they could do the rubbish ones. It seems like we're just arguing about how much effort they would be willing to put into these monuments. I really wanted to find a, a specific example where we could really get an idea of the numbers that the ancient Egyptians were willing to throw at a project like this. On the screen now should be uh, Medinet Habu, the mortuary temple of Ramses III. It was a palace and some other administrative things too, but his uh, mortuary temple. According to this document we have called the Great Harris Papyrus, and I'll put the source in the description, uh, this is a document that describes uh, Ramses III's reign, and it's written by his successor so that he can kind of get an idea of where the men are and what the state of the government is. And one of the things this papyrus details is the distribution of, of labor, where the men are working on various projects. According to this papyrus, Ramses III assigned 62,000 men to build this temple. Now we don't know what assigning a man meant to the ancient Egyptians. Was that 62,000 people who were literally directly employed? Or does that temple now have the right to tax 62,000 houses? We don't know. Either way, I'm sure you agree, that's a lot of resources dedicated to this one project. If you consider the fact that many of these men would have been the heads of houses, heads of extended households, we're potentially talking hundreds of thousands of people are caught up in the construction and maintenance of this temple. A small city, massive amount of people. So let's take this granite statue from there and run some super hypothetical numbers. Obviously not all of those 62,000 people can be put to work making one statue. So let's say just a thousand of them are. And Ramses III ruled for 31 years, I believe. So let's give them, I don't know, 10% of that time, three years. Could 1,000 people over three years produce this statue? I see absolutely no reason to think that they couldn't, no reason whatsoever. And that is far less men and far less time than that project had available to them. So when we consider the manpower that was available to ancient Egyptians, you know, a country with a population of millions, tens of thousands of people can be devoted to specific projects. And of course, constructing a mortuary temple for the Pharaoh is a massive priority. I see no reason why they couldn't have produced any of these granite statues. 
And if they could have produced these, then they could have produced any other granite object, as far as I'm concerned. Question number two, three. We've got to talk about the writing. Often I see on the internet that the assigning of a monument back in time to this lost civilization is based on the fact that the writing that the Egyptians put on these monuments is allegedly lesser in quality than the work that went into the monument itself. First of all, I disagree. And I hate the way that people, armchair experts, I know I'm an expert at absolutely nothing, but also other armchair experts, describe the writing so negatively, so poorly, crappy and such. Crappy nature of the hieroglyphics. That, I hate that man, I hate that. As if they could produce anything even remotely similar. I hate it. But second of all, uh, the only writing on these monuments is Egyptian, so whatever your opinion of the quality of it, it's literally infinitely better than the writing of any other civilization, surely. Yeah, and you can't say the Egyptians just polished the monuments clean to put their writing on it. If they had the ability to do that, there's nothing to stop them producing them in the first place. Surely, right? And, you know, I think of all the monuments we'd have found, they'd have slipped up on one of them if they're so crappy and bad at their jobs, like Brian Forrester would say. Such terrible craftsmen. And then surely they'd mess up on one statue sooner or later and we'd see some Atlantean writing. Yet we don't. Thirdly, more importantly, these are just cherry-picked examples. We could find Egyptian monuments that had incredible hieroglyphics on them, deeply carved, perfectly symmetrical, all the way up the monument. If we're assigning the authorship of these monuments to a civilization based on the quality of the writing, then according to that logic, these had to have been made by Egyptians, right? So let's discuss a specific example. Uh, on screen right now, you should be looking at the Lateran obelisk in Rome. The Romans like to move obelisks around because they are genuinely fantastic and impressive and beautiful. So the Lateran obelisk is 30 meters, weighs 400 tons, fantastic hieroglyphics on it. So it must be assigned to Egyptians, therefore. If they can move a 400 ton obelisk, then there's no object that you could point to in ancient Egypt and say they couldn't have done this. Because clearly they made this one, if we're judging it on the writing and the quality of the writing. And this is absolutely bloody massive, so they definitely made that. Whatever your opinion of Egyptian writing, it is the only writing on them. There's no Atlantean writing, there's no writing from any other lost civilization. To catapult it back in time, based on the writing, makes no sense because the only writing on it is Egyptian. The funny thing about that Brian Forrester video where he calls the hieroglyphics crappy. I hate that he said that, by the way. I don't know if I made that clear. I hate that he said that. Um, is that he also states that the sarcophagus is unfinished. And academics still insist that the box and the hieroglyphics are contemporary with one another, but the hieroglyphics are very poor, unfinished. So he creates this civilization because he believes there's a mismatch between the hieroglyphics and the workmanship put into the sarcophagus. But the sarcophagus isn't even finished. This writing could have just been the initial outline where they double checked exactly what they wanted to say before they got down to some serious work. And then with the twists and turns of history, it just never got done. There's no need to invent another civilization. I don't get it. Another question I have, how would you explain the fact that art changes over time? Check that gift out. Old Kingdom art is not the same as Middle Kingdom art. It's not the same as New Kingdom art. It declines during intermediate periods. You know, the art's not the same during those times. Sometimes art changes dramatically. That progression through time would not be obvious if these objects were inherited from another civilization because presumably they would be found at random, right? Check out this gift. I'm the world's best dad. Let me give you a couple of concrete examples. So as far as I'm aware, could be wrong, as far as I'm aware though, the largest statues, the largest monuments are made by pharaohs that have really long and powerful reigns. Like Amenhotep III ruled for 38 years, produced huge granite objects. These ones at the British Museum, just the head is bigger than a person. These were absolutely massive and it was produced by a king with a long and successful reign. Ramses II, another 
famously powerful king, famously long reigned, produced huge sculptures. One of the problems with kings that ruled for a short time or were politically weak is that they didn't produce huge monuments, so we just know less about them. If these monuments are being found at random, that's hard to explain if the Egyptians are inheriting these objects, in my opinion. That would be very difficult to explain. Not only that, but art can change dramatically when there's a political or religious revolution, the best example being the Amarna period. In this period, the pharaoh Akhenaten gets it into his head to uh, change the religion of ancient Egypt. And uh, starts worshipping the Aten. And now all the iconography reflects that, and they make really funky statues where Akhenaten is portrayed as really curvy, and people have elongated heads, like this uh, quartz statue of a uh, princess or Nefertiti. We're not sure who it's assigned to, but they, they're given elongating heads and all these things. It's really distinctive artistic style. How could we explain a sudden shift in artistic style if these objects are being found? If they're being found at random, the Egyptians are just inheriting them, wouldn't we see these objects placed uh, throughout time, throughout the pharaonic period, not just in Amarna, not just for the reign of Akhenaten? What about the rare occasions when a woman comes to the throne like Hatshepsut, and now the pharaoh is portrayed as a woman, naturally? They can't have just been finding statues of women at that particular time. And if you say, oh, well, the Egyptians did make that statue, but not other ones, where's the line? That statue of Hatshepsut, it's, it's great. It's a great statue. The creator of that could have made any other granite object you point at. It's just a matter of, like, time and effort. Question number whatever. What are Egyptians doing at granite quarries? No one could deny that they're working there, surely. You know, we have workmen's villages, inscriptions, written documents. The Egyptians are for sure working at granite quarries and the quarries of other hard rocks. What are they doing there if they can barely even work the stuff? Surely they would realize that they're just wasting their time. They wouldn't be working on them generation after generation. I really wanted to find a really cool and interesting example from the quarries to illustrate the fact that real Egyptians are working on these things. On the screen now, you are looking at a joint funerary inscription of a father and son of team of artists. This is next to the granite quarries in Aswan. Uh, the father and son are called Men and Back. Men, the father, is on the right. He worked under Amenhotep III, who built these huge granite statues. And he is praying to a large granite statue. Uh, next to him is his son Back, who worked for Amenhotep's son. Akhenaten during that Amarna period. He's praying to the Aten, to that sun disk that they suddenly started worshipping. What a perfect snapshot in time. What a perfect illustration of the fact that there are real Egyptians behind these monuments, real craftsmen who are behind the huge monuments of Amenhotep, behind this new artwork of the Amarna style. We literally have an inscription from a father-son duo from a granite quarry where they're each praying to their the symbols of their respective pharaoh. That's such fantastic contextual evidence that real Egyptians are working on these objects and a beautiful moment in time. That's an absolutely stunning inscription. Beautiful moment in time. Beautiful to think about their lives and their, their achievements. They're clearly proud of the fact that they work on these monuments for their pharaohs. I really feel like I could ask these questions all day. Like, wouldn't it be odd if the great pharaohs of Egyptian civilization were not great builders, but great finders? Wouldn't it be odd that this statue of Ramses the Great in between the two patron deities of Thebes, Mut and Amun, exists? Not because Ramses wanted to display his power to the city of Thebes, but because he found it. Makes no sense. Wouldn't it be odd that the, the symbols of ancient Egyptian religion were totally out of their control, yet somehow they still managed to make a, a coherent religion out of all of these symbols, despite the fact that they have no control over what they show or what they represent? It'd be so odd for a civilization to work that way. It'd be so odd that the sarcophaguses that we find in tombs are not designed to be sarcophaguses, but were designed to be something else and the Egyptians just found them 
and they just happened to find enough of them for their tombs. Unfortunately, the last civilization left no writing on them, so they were able to create incredibly elaborate writings and, and statues to put on them. It makes no sense. And if you say, well, those are the ones the Egyptians did make. Well, if they had the ability to make all these things, massive sarcophaguses, 400 ton obelisks, big statues of their gods and their kings, then what couldn't they make? Why, why would we need to create or invent another civilization for any of the other pieces of stonework? I just don't get it. Uh, what was I gonna say? But yeah, basically, probably end the video there because I've shown off all my hats now and I feel like the questions I've asked are good and are honest questions. And so I'm just gonna let you all argue about it in the comments. I'd like to thank all my Patreons for all of this. They're not actually my Patreons, I just found them and I repurposed them for my ends. So thanks for just being found, Patreons. I appreciate it. <laughs> See ya.